17 in your packets, you have the beginning of the unit four review here. And in unit four, there were definitely some different objectives that kind of were very unrelated to each other. Um, the, interpret the meaning of a derivative in its context. You know, do you know that a derivative is a rate of some sort? And way back then, that's when you, you know, first were learning that. In section 4.2, we did straight line motion, or I, I'll say 4.2, but it's really unit 4.2, not chapter. Okay, I'm not talking about your textbook. But velocity acceleration, um, AP Live is going to be starting next week, so we'll talk more about that next week. Section 4.3, rates of change um, in applied context other than motion. So maybe having something to do with uh, water flowing out of um, a cone or, you know, different things like that. Um, introduction to related rates, which kind of ties together with that 4.3. 4.6, the tangent line approximations. As long as you could find the tangent line, you could approximate something on a graph even if it was a little bit off and it wasn't exactly at that point, you could still use it. And then L'Hopital's rule actually is in unit four for AP, even though we didn't do it till the end because our textbook didn't have it until chapter nine, okay? But that's okay. You know it and that's the important thing. So we have a few fill in the blank things. In section, it kind of goes through each section, uh, 4.1, 4.2, et cetera. Um, it says the function C of X gives the cost of digging. So this right here is the cost uh, of digging a hole that is X feet deep. And it says C of 20 equals 140 means that a hole blank deep. So how deep is it? Which of those numbers represents how deep it is? Uh-huh. 20, you got it costs, and then the other number, $140 to dig. Now it says C prime of 20 means that when the hole is 20 feet deep, maybe I should have put feet up in that one, the cost of digging is blank at a rate of blank. So we got to fill in the blanks here. This five right here represents what? When you take the derivative, what does the derivative represent? So if you originally started with feet here and you had dollars here and you take the slope, which is y over x, dollars per foot, Use the labels to help you, you know, as you do this. The cost of digging is five dollars, is, uh, da, 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 da. say it again, what did you say? No. Increasing at a rate of five dollars per foot. If it came out negative, it'd be decreasing. So if the cost of something was coming down, it would be decreasing. So what if we took like the second derivative? That would be more in the situation you're like, if you could buy five for ten dollars, you could buy, uh, you know, like not it's just totally separate from this, where like the more you buy, the cheaper it gets, you know, like per unit. That would be like more of an acceleration kind of thing, you know, it's slowing down or speeding up sort of thing with with that. Then in section 4.2, a particle moves back and forth on a horizontal track from a time of zero to pi over two minutes. The particle's position in feet is given by the function s of t equals one half tangent of t. Find the acceleration of the particle at a time of pi over six minutes and indicate the units of measure. So s of t is the particle's position. I would have to find v of t, derivative of tangent, help me out squared. So I'm going to go ahead and write it like this because I know that I have to take the derivative again. And then from there to find the acceleration, I'm going to, and this goes back to yesterday with the chain rule. The two multiplies out front, knocks down by one. So this is secant of x to the first. 
And then peel that outside layer away and multiply by the derivative of secant, which is secant x tangent x. So the acceleration is secant squared x tangent x. So that's the function itself, but then they said evaluated at pi over 6 minutes. So then from there, a of pi over 6 is secant of pi over 6. And we're going to square that. And then tangent of pi over 6. On the unit circle, pi over 6 is over here. It's the point square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So that's 2 over the square root of 3, and I'm supposed to be squaring that. Tangent of pi over 6 is sine over cosine, which ends up being 1 over the square root of 3. So this is 4 over 3 times 1 over rad 3, which is 4 over 3 rad 3. But I also had to include the label. And you're totally fine leaving the square root in the denominator, okay? AP generally would give the answer like that. They wouldn't even move the square root to the numerator at all, okay? Because they don't want you messing up on the algebra if you can get the calculus. Find the acceleration at a time of pi over 6 minutes. It says, and indicate the units of measure. Now, this here was talking about back and forth particles positions given by this. There we go. I was looking for that word. Feet and minutes. So velocity is feet per minute. What's acceleration going to be? Feet per minute, per minute squared. Or feet per minute per minute is another way. Same thing. Okay. They're, they wouldn't give you both, but they could give you either. I see them more with feet per minute squared. Okay. Section 4.3 says P of T models the size of the population at a time greater than zero. Which of the following differential equations describes linear growth in the size of the population? And which, which describes exponential growth? Okay. Well, what you could do is you could take a look at each of these and kind of even think of their antiderivative. If you found the antiderivative of 200, wouldn't it be 200t plus c, right? So that's definitely linear. The next one would be p equals 200t squared over 2, which would be 100t squared plus c. That's not linear or exponential, right? That's quadratic. The next one would be 100 t cubed over 3 plus c. That is cubic. It's not linear or exponential. 200 p would be, oh, oh, p, hmm, not t. So that one needs some more work. So does this one over here. See how these are t's and these are p's? So for this one here, I would really have oh, I'm gonna run out of room here. Let me do that. Put the pseudo right above it, and then I'll work above it. That means I need separation of variables. It's gonna be one over p dp equals two hundred dp, and find the antiderivative that way. Antiderivative of this is natural log of absolute value of p, and this is 200t plus c, of course. So if I solved for p right here, I would end up getting e to that, e to the 200t plus c, which is exponential, okay? So this one here is exponential. And then what about this guy right here? It's going to be uh, 1 over p squared equals 100 dt 
Oh, I forgot my DT right there. So that's going to end up being negative 1 over PQ equals 100T, which the anti, that's, that's not at all, you know, that's not exponential either, so that's neither. So these were the two right here and right here, linear and exponential. But that's how you go about it. Next one, determine dz dt if you know that z equals xy squared, z is 3, y is 1 half, dx dt is negative 2, and dy dt is 5. So I notice here that I have a z and a y, but they are not giving me an x. So I might first find x. So it's going to be z equals, so z is 3. I was teaching this over. I was trying not to use a whole lot of space to find that. 3 equals x times 1 fourth. So 12 equals x. I'm going to also need that. So now I have x, y, and z. I have dx, dt, dy, dt, and now I can find dz, dt as well. You know, like that's what the question is. All right. Well, in order to find dz, dt, I need to take and find the derivative of both sides. So let's see, the derivative of z, the left side there, is dz dt. The derivative of the right side is a product rule. The derivative of x is 1. This is with respect to t. So it's going to be 1, but then it's going to be dx dt since it's with respect to t. There's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, which is 2y dy dt. And now plug everything in you know. dz dt is what we're finding. Equals 1 times dx dt, which is negative 2. y squared, which is 1 fourth. Plus 2 times x, which is 12. Times y, which is 1 half times dy dt, which is 5. So let's see, that comes out to 1 half plus 16. Let me redo that. But half of 12 is 6. 6 times 5 is 30, and 30 times 2 is 60. So 60.5 is dz dt. Yes? Did you leave out the negative at the point? I sure did. 59 and a half. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I totally lost sight of that guy. Yes? This two right here came from right there. I pulled it out in front of that. So you might have 12 times 2 times 1 half. And it's the same result. So is all of this coming back to you? Right? Finding derivatives. Probably the one you saw more frequently was x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Right? Remember that one? And you took the derivative of each, but then you needed the z dt, x dt, dy dt. You know, they were trying to give you something different than that right there. Um, section 4.5, there'll be a free respo response question that we hit on that, so we'll skip that for now. Section 4.6, given g of x is a differentiable function about which little else is known other than g of negative 3 equals 2 and g prime of negative 3 equals 7. So knowing the slope and knowing a point, we can write the equation of the tangent line, right? It says, use the tangent line of g of x at x equals negative 3 to approximate something close to it, which is negative 2.9. So remember, this here is the point negative 3, 2. And the slope that was given at that same point is 7. So I have y minus th uh, 2 equals 7 times x plus 3. And you might remember, we actually changed this to like a linearization. We changed the y to an L of x and just moved the 2 to the other side. 2 plus 7 times x plus 3. 
and then plugging the negative 2.9 in. 2 plus 7 times negative 2.9 plus 3 is 2 plus 7 times 0 0.1, which is 2 plus 0 0.7, or 2.7. And when we did that linearization, we didn't distribute it in like that because then we could do the problem. We could plug that negative 2.9 in and do it without a calculator. So we kind of left it just like that. Um, so if you distributed and changed it to point sl or slope intercept form, um, it ended up hurting you mathematically. Like it made the problem more difficult for you. Okay, which you wouldn't think would be the case, but it, it would be. And then the last one on this page says the limit as x approaches 5 of x to the 4th minus 625 over x squared minus 25. This is one of those L'Hopital ones. When you plug the 5 in, 5 to the 4th is 625. So 625 minus 625, which is 0 on the top. And then 5 squared is 25 minus 25, which is 0 on the bottom. And just having that alone, it's L'Hopital worthy. Okay. So then we take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. Now you have two choices at this point. You can plug the 5 in and get 0 over 0 again. Oh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't give you 0 over 0, does it? It gives you 125 times 4, which is 500, over 10, which is 50. Your other option, though, what I was going to say is you could have reduced that down to four or two x squared. The limit as x approaches five of two x squared, and you would have had two times twenty-five, which is also fifty. I put the little disclaimer in there again. Reviews do not cover all the material in the lessons, but will hopefully remind you of key points. To be prepared, you must study all of the packets that are given to you. Okay. And whenever I give you an extended response, make sure you're very specific in your answering. Okay. And we'll talk more about that next week. I don't know if you looked ahead to the uh, the um, the week at a glance for next week. Tuesday I have set aside for just questions, okay? I don't have anything extra on that day, it's just questions. So start compiling your list of questions for Tuesday, okay? Monday is just a one through four. You know how we've done one through four this week? It's just a one through four, work on these problems, see how you do, just all of them mixed together, okay? Um, and again, it goes kind of through here again. Exponential derivatives. The derivative of e to the u is e to the u times u prime. a to the u is a to the u, natural log of a. But then times u prime again. Derivative of natural log of u is 1 over u, but then times u prime. And log base a of u. We, haven't talk, we didn't talk about that one yet, did we? It's at 1 over u, just like this guy is, but then the natural log of a is down there at the bottom, but then still times u prime, where u is a function. Okay, this one is not used and questioned as much, maybe like one. Okay, so here we have e to the 4x cubed, the derivative of that, it's just saying find the derivative of each, um, is e to the 4x cubed. But then don't forget the chain rule. Derivative of 4x cubed is 12x squared. Derivative of 5, natural log of 8x is 5 times 1 over 8x. But then don't forget the derivative of 8x, which is 8. So that one would be kind of reducing 5 over x. If you forgot that 8, guess what? <laughs> yep, 8B is going to have it on there. These problems here are very much multiple choice. Okay. 
you're going to like the multiple choice. You're going to feel really good about the non-calculator multiple choice. You'll just like, give me more, give me more. Like you'll, you, By the time you get to that point, those are the ones you'll like. The ones that will make you nervous are the two extended response calculator. Those are the toughest on the whole test. F of x equals e to the sine of x to the fourth. So for the derivative of that, of course, your e's, you love those. It's just e to whatever's there. But then we have the chain rule. The derivative of sine is cosine of x to the fourth. But then you have to peel that layer away and multiply by the derivative of that, which is 4x cubed. You can't um, simplify that anymore. They likely would probably take the 4x cubed out to the front in front of the e. But, you know, not that you really have to rewrite it in any way. Nothing combines together. And then another natural log. Let's see. The derivative of natural log is 1 over cosine of 5x, but then don't forget the chain rule. Peel that layer away, multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is negative sine of 5x. And then peel that layer away and multiply by the derivative of that, which is 5. So that one there, they likely would have for the answer negative 5 tangent of 5x. They will probably not leave it as it is. Everybody see where I'm getting that? Right, sine over cosine is the same thing as tangent. And then I have a negative 5 there too. I, didn't, I almost forgot the negative, but it's there. Yeah. And then we have one with a log right there, an L-O-G log. So that's 1 over whatever's in the parentheses, but then times the natural log of that base. But then don't forget the chain rule. Peel that outside layer away. Multiply by the derivative of the inside. And of course, that simplifies to 2 over x ln 4. Two over x ln 4. And then finally on this one, f prime of x, let's see, 3 to the tangent x is going to be 3 to the tangent x, is exactly as it is, times the natural log of the base. But then peel that layer away and multiply by the derivative of tangent, which is secant squared of x. And again, there's nothing you can do right there as far as simplifying. Again, hopefully, as we go over these, they're coming back to you. Okay. Many of them we've used throughout the year, but sometimes there's one that's kind of left off. You have your inverse trig functions. Do you have those? Do I need to take and write those down right now? You have them on your sheet, right? I'd rather kind of get to something else. Um, derivative of the inverse, that's the one that, you know, we had talked about yesterday um, with that. So, you know, I'll just leave that since you have that already, but we can go ahead and, and do the problems dealing with these. Okay. So the derivative of sine inverse, sine inverse um, is 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever squared. The whatever's whatever's in the parentheses. But then don't forget the chain rule multiplying by the 8. That is a time sign. So we end up with 8 over the square root of 1 minus 64x squared. Secant inverse. That one is also a 1 on the top, but it has an absolute value and a square root on the bottom. So the absolute value has whatever's in the parentheses. The square root has the whatever squared minus 1. So where sine and cosine have 1 minus, secant and cosecant have the whatever minus. So we have an x squared in there. And then chain rule times 2x. So I end up with 2 over absolute value of x because the x from the numerator and denominator reduce. Square root of x to the fourth minus 1. 
And then a cotangent inverse, well, it begins with C, so that means it has a negative 1 on the top, right? Cotangent 1 plus whatever squared. And so we put a 2x in there. And then the derivative of 2x is 2, so there's your chain rule. So we have negative 2 over 1 plus 4x squared. Bless you. Um, here's just like we did these, you know, yesterday as well. So there was kind of some overlapping with um, unit three and unit four with the inverses. Here, f and g are inverses, is what that little line is telling us right now. So if f of six is negative one and f prime of six is three, find g of negative one and g prime of negative one. So what's g of negative one? Anybody? Six. And g prime of negative one? One third, right? Just the reciprocal. So we reviewed those yesterday, so these two should be pretty good. All right, so this next one, what is f of 7 going to be? Perfect. And f prime of 7, negative 1 third. So I put one positive, one negative on there to make sure you see that. I think all of them we did yesterday maybe were positive, so we needed to see a negative 1 there. L'Hopital's rule, L'Hopital says, if you get 0 over 0, well, guess what? If you get infinity over infinity, it's the same thing. You, what you could do is just take the derivative of the top. And the derivative of the bottom, and then recalculate it out, plugging the number in. And you see in all caps, L'Hopital's rule is not the quotient rule. Okay, you're not doing derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. You're simply finding the individual derivatives of each. But you first have to make sure it's L'Hopital worthy. Okay, so plugging the two in here, I get zero. Plugging the two in here, I get four minus 14 plus 10, which is also zero. It's L'Hopital worthy. That means I can rewrite this as 1 over 2x minus 7, and then plug the 2 in again, which is negative 1 third. For this next one, I end up with 0 over e to the zeros, 1 minus 1 minus 0, so that's 0 over 0 as well. So I take the derivative of the top and bottom, which is 6x over e to the x minus 1, and now plug the 0 in. I get 0, well, let me write it over here, 0 over 1 minus 1, which again is 0 over 0. That means we do it again, which is 6 over e to the x which is 6 over 1, which is just 6 for the answer there, which is 0. Plugging the 3 in, let's see, I see a 0 on the bottom. I get 9 minus 6 plus 1. 9 minus 6 is 3. 3 plus 1 is 4. 4 over 0. Mm -hmm. Can't use what we tell on that. And so that's where they could trick you. Like you might assume that's what it's going to be. In that particular case right there, the limit might just not exist. Okay, they might just be going in different directions. And so for that, we would just say DNE does not exist. It can't factor that, like the numerator factors into X minus one and X minus one, but nothing cancels with that denominator of X minus three. So it just plain does not exist. There is nothing I can do with that problem, okay? And that's all right. If you looked at that one, there is a vertical asymptote right there, and it's probably something like this. The limit as x approaches 3 does not exist. It's allowed to not exist, okay? But we get so focused on doing problems that we kind of forget about. 
Next one, we plug the zero in, we end up getting zero over one minus one, which is zero over zero. So we take the derivative of the top, which is two x. The derivative of the bottom, well, the derivative of one is zero. The derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. But then don't forget the chain rule times three. So plugging the zero in, I again get zero over zero. So we take the derivative again. So we get two over three cosine of three x times three, or two over nine cosine of three x. And when we plug the zero in, we get 2 over 9 times 1, which is 2 ninths. So I tried to come up with a variety so that you see they don't all work exactly the same way. They can have e to the x's, they can have polynomials, you know, they can have all different things here. And then this next one, again, let's see, that was going to be 16 minus 24 minus 40. 16, it was, that's definitely not zero on the top, even though it's zero on the bottom. Oh, it is? Okay. Oh, yeah, I guess it is. Oh, there we go. Oh. Oh. 16 plus 24. So it is 0 minus 40. So it's 0 over 0. So we take the derivative of the top, which is 2x plus 6, and the derivative of the bottom, which is negative 1, and pop it in there. We get 8 plus 6 over negative 1, which is negative 14. And then the last one... <laughs> kind of misplaced. It doesn't ask you for the limit here, it just asks you for the derivative. Okay, so the derivative of that, that is the quotient rule, right? So we have the derivative of the top times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top divided by the bottom squared. is 15x plus 3 minus 15x plus 10. It just went out. Right. Come back. the 15s cancel, giving you uh, 10, that was a 10 right there, right? 13 over, sorry about that mess, uh, 5x plus 1 squared. Okay. Are we on time? What time is this bell ring? 12? Okay. These last three problems are all on the back sheet right here, and they're pieces. And here's the one thing I want to point out. This was from 2019. It was on both the A, B, and the B, C portions of um, the exam, okay? They have a couple of problems. B, C has a couple of problems that are same as yours. It was question number four. This one here was in 2018. It was on both parts. It was question number four on the exam. This one here was from 2017. It was on both parts. It was question number four. You starting to see a pattern? AP will have questions that are very closely the same as the questions from the previous year, and they're even the same numbers when it comes to the extended response. Okay? So question number four, you can expect to look like these right here. So what's good for us to do is to take and focus on that kind so that you see it over and over and over. So when you sit down that day, you're like, number four should be this kind. 
Okay, we can't do that with a multiple choice. That's not the case. But we can do that with most of the extended response. They always have one that they threw us for a loop on. But the others are like boom, 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 pretty much the same. They change the wording. Okay, so truly, if I get over one part of this, the others are not your homework. We'll, we'll get them, we'll get to them next week. Okay, um, but if I get over one part, that will be good. If you decide that you want to go on and do more of these before I see you next, that's fine, but you don't have any homework this weekend. Your packet that you had, you had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to work on it, and you have Monday, Tuesday next week to work on it. Okay, so do not think that you have to do any calculus over the weekend. But if you want to, you certainly can. You have stuff you could work on, okay? Here it says a, a cylindrical barrel with a diameter of two feet. That means the radius is one foot. Collected rainwater as shown in the figure above. The water drains out through a valve that is not shown in the bottom of the barrel. This is just like your hot water heater. Your hot water heater the water leaves through the bottom and it fills in at the top. So when you, if you took a shower this morning, your hot water heater went through this same process. Okay. The rate of change of the height, that's dH dt, of the water in the barrel with respect to time is modeled by this equation. That's saying, as the water's coming out, the water level's going down. Okay, you hear people say, you used all the hot water. It's because you emptied the tank. You know, you took too long of a shower. Whatever it was, that's what's happening. And then it fills back in, then you have to wait for it to heat back up again. Uh, where H is measured in feet and T is measured in seconds. When I read the problem, this is exactly what I do. I underline these things so that I don't have to go back and search for them. My eyes will go right to the underlying stuff when I come back. The volume of the cylinder with a radius of R and a height of H is given by this formula. So they're giving you a formula right here. Find the rate of change of volume. This is asking me to find dV, right? So if volume is pi R squared H, it's asking me to find dV. And it's probably going to be dt, dv dt, okay? But they might be giving me something else. Uh, with respect to time, when the height of the water is four feet, indicate units of measure. So this is when the height is four feet. Is the height always four feet? No. So I cannot just plug the four into this right here. Is the radius, no matter where that height is, always one? Yes, that is what I can plug into that formula, okay? But if it was a cone, would the radius always be the same? No, so I'd have to do that differently. So it depends on the problem that's given. We do know that R is one. So that means we can say V equals pi H. I can change the formula to that. So DV DT then, is the derivative of this right here, which would be pi, derivative of h is one, but then dh dt. Do I know dh dt? And, oh, yes, I do, it's right there. Don't worry about those, we'll, we'll spend a day next week and get those done, okay?